We're going to try it again. Going live. Going live. Hopefully they'll come back. Are we You're live. Live now? Yep, hopefully they'll come back. Alright. Shane's got Shane wants to turn us off.
be afraid and why? And I, when I saw him, I felt his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me and saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. That is the scripture that we'll be addressing this morning. Fear. Why we should not fear and how not to fear. If there was ever a, a message that we spent a myriad of time to do, we looked up the word fear. The Bible says quite a bit about fear, and so does the, the secular world. Mr. Webster says this, that fear is an emotion built into our being, built it into every human being that has ever lived our emotions. Fear is one of them. Webster defines it as a strong feeling, mentally and bodily reactions, fear and anger accompanied by a strong feeling. Of course, there is scores of emotions that run through our bodies that make us up, that God put into our souls, into our structures, into our very fabric of who we are. But fear is an emotion that has two sides. It can control us or we can not allow it to be our master. Martin Luther once wrote a quote, and I looked diligently for it this past week trying to find it. I wrote it down somewhere. And around our house, if it's on an infamous piece of paper, someday it might turn up. But it goes something like this, what I can recall of it. Martin Luther wrote, emotions change. But the gospel of Jesus Christ, God's word, doesn't change. It doesn't fluctuate. If there was ever a scripture that we need to have concreted into our heart, it comes from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, and I hope you know it by heart. Jesus Christ, the same, yesterday and today and forever. The word of God in Jesus Christ does not change. Fear has a devastating effects on our lives. Fear leads to hatred, rumors, gossip, hoarding, doomsday preppers, self-preservation. You know, it's all about me. I want that roll of toilet paper and I'll stomp on some senior citizen to get it because it's all about me. You remember back in 1999 when we were going to switch over into 2000? The hype about what was going to take place, airplanes were going to fall out of the sky and uh, financial markets were going to crash. People were building bunkers. You see, fear incites rushes on institutions. Fear incites riots. It promotes greed by the inflation of normal everyday commodities. Inflated prices, shortages, some of them real, some of them created. And there's also those individuals who will take advantage of the aspect of fear on humanity. There was a world leader not too long ago that said, let's not waste a good crisis. In other words, let's overreach our powers and promote our covert agendas. 
These things are real. It's kind of like we were watching last night's news. But how do we deal with fear? How is it that that which is in us, how do we contend with it? Fear has always been with us. How do you know that, Pastor? Well, I can go back to Genesis chapter 3 in verse 10. In the garden, Adam said, and he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Of course, you remember how that's, who said you were naked? Why were you afraid, Adam? The day before when God walked through the garden with him, he wasn't afraid, but now he is. See, sin entered the world. Sin entered humanity. That which courses through our veins, that which causes the fear and destruction is a result of sin. You and I have what is known as a sin nature. You see, when Adam stood before a righteous and holy God, he knew that he had done wrong. The guilt of sin was upon him. And fear of God, fear that once was, has broken that fellowship with his creator. But thanks be to Jesus Christ who reestablished that communication and broke away that fear, broke away that guilt, broke away that being ashamed. But still, fear permeates the human soul. And there's some fear that's good. Proverbs 1 and 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. In other words, we need to know and reverence, reverence the God that created us. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. See, that's part of the problem. People have lost their reverence towards God, their Heavenly Father. They have lost reverence and fear of their creator. Oh, and, and by the way, this week, coming up on Thursday, I believe it is, the anti-God, anti-Bible crowd, they have their own biblical holiday. Pastor, what are you talking about? You know, they're trying to erase Christmas. They try to take Easter. But you know, these individuals who hate God or are against God, they have their own biblical holiday too. Psalms 53 and 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So All Fools Day is a biblical holiday to those individuals that reject our Lord. Somebody should say amen. I hope you're saying amen at all. If fear was not a problem, why did God say to Joshua as he was taking over for, for Moses who led the Hebrew children? Joshua chapter 1 verse 9 says, Have I not commanded you? In other words, God is saying to Joshua, Have I not called you? Have I not commissioned you to be strong and of good courage? Do not be afraid nor dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And God's word doesn't change. He goes with us yet today, wherever we go. Back in Deuteronomy, the Lord said to the children of Israel, Hear, O Israel, Today you are on the verge of battle with your enemies. Let not your hearts be faint, and do not be afraid, and do not tremble or be terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against 
your enemies to save you. You see, whenever the battle belongs to the Lord, it's good to not to be afraid. It's good to allow the Lord to fight our battles. If God is for us, who can be against us? God and you are a majority. It was David that crossed that, the, the valley as he faced that giant. He ran across there not because he had all the strength and the power to do it on his own, but he knew that he was on God's side. But yet sometimes fear and doubt creep into our lives. And fear and doubt are contagious. In that same passage there in Deuteronomy, the officers, God is saying, the officer, officer shall speak to the people, saying, What man is, is there who is fearful and faint hearted? Let him go and return to his house, lest the heart of his brethren faint like his heart. You see, fear is contagious. It spreads like a cancer, like a wildfire. Wait, you say, well, how does that happen? It happens in most churches. Have any of you ever heard this? Oh, we've never done that before. There's a mighty move of God and there's something that's happened, but oh, we didn't do that. We've always done it this way. Or a host of other excuses. Fear. Doubt. So what are we going to do with these? We see here that fear and doubt affected the individuals of the New Testament. We see the disciples as they're crossing the Sea of Galilee and the storm blows up. We've got four professional fishermen who made their life on the Sea of Galilee. And the storm blows up. Jesus is in the back of the boat taking a nap on a pillow. And then wake him up and say, Lord, don't you care that we die? Fear. Fear. Of course, Jesus addressed that problem by just standing up and saying, Peace, be still. The same way that he can eradicate all the things that are happening in our world, especially the coronavirus or COVID-19 or whatever you want to call it, he can say, Peace, be still, and it will totally go away. But we live in fear. Even the disciples, after the crucifixion of Christ, we read in John chapter, chapter 20 that they, they did because they were afraid of the Jews. They were afraid of their own countrymen that something might happen to them like they did to Jesus. Of course, Jesus walked in the midst of them and said, I'm here. I'm here. He's here this morning. He's in your house with you this morning. We have no need to fear. Millions of people shudder this hour out of fear. Back in the late 60s into the early 70s, there was a, a group of individuals that terrorized the five boroughs of New York City. They were called the Black Panthers. People were saying, oh, they can't go to the grocery store. Oh, the Panthers were out. They can't go out and enjoy a meal to a restaurant. You know, the Panthers are out. Every act of violence and every criminal activity was given credit to the Panthers. Oh, we can't do this because the Panthers are out. They're there. Millions of people were trembling in fear. They were altering their lifestyle because of this group of individuals called the Panthers, the Black Panthers. Eventually, the band was dis was broken up. There was approximately 30 people 
in this band of Black Panthers. 30 people terrorized millions of people, made them tremble in fear. We need not to live in fear. The Bible gives us some instructions on how to deal with fear. In the book of Psalms, David here pens this particular passage of scripture. This takes place in about 1062 B.C. Now, B.C. there meant before Christ, not before Corona. How not to fear? David was being hounded by Saul. We can read about that back in, in, in Samuel. He was being chased, hunted down. Saul wanted to kill him. But here David says, what time I am afraid. David gives us four things to look at here. Four ways that we can use the word of God. David sets down a pattern for you and I to follow. He said, at what time I am afraid. Deep David recognizes that there is the presence of fear. The presence of fear. He recognizes that emotion. But then he says in the very next breath, I will trust you. I will trust you. David turned to God. I will trust you. The Word of God tells us that we are to trust in the Lord. You know, in the very center of the Word of God, it's Psalms 118, 8, the very, boom, center of God's Word. It says this, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the middle, it says it's better to trust God than to put, have confidence in man. At the very end, in Revelation 22, 21, it says, Ever the Lord, quickly come. But here, David sets a pattern for you and I. Gives us an antidote, a cure for fear. Sets us free from the clutches of that which can pull us down. David doesn't deny that there is an emotion called fear. But he turns to the word of God and says, I will trust you. I will trust you, Lord. Do you trust the Lord this morning? And he calls, recalls there in the next verse, I will praise you in, in his word. In God, I will praise you his word in God. You see, he recalls that which was written, that which was revealed to him through the scriptures. Knowing God and what his, his promises are. Same Bible. Same word. Same God. Same hope. Same promises. So number one, David recognizes that there is fear. He turns to, trust, turns to God and I will trust him. He recalls that the word of God revealed to him his promises. And the last thing it says, I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. David determined not to anticipate fear. Fear is real. Well, why should we anticipate it? Or why should we ponder on it? Why should we stew on it? Why should we look forward to it? Why should we worry about it? We should not worry about all these things. Should we be concerned? Yes. Should we be prepared? Yes. But not allow it to consume us. Because we know that God is in control. You know, it's easy to look at the circumstances, the problems, and the difficulties and allow our minds to be become overrun with helplessness and hopelessness. 
If that happens, we should recognize that those emotions, those thoughts, they're not coming from God. They're coming from our own mind. That's what the Apostle Paul warned young Timothy about there in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Maybe someone preached all that. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Paul is telling Timothy, that spirit of fear is not to let your mind wander. Keep focused on your call, why you have been sent, why you are here. Do not allow fear to overrun you, but of power, the power that the Holy Spirit gives the individual to overcome those things that are in, in their life. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. If you were here two weeks ago, we talked about the helmet of salvation. That which, when we put on the armor of God, we put on the salvation, of helmet of salvation, that means we, all, our thought processes should align with, with God's. We have the power and of love and of a sound mind. 1 John 4, 17 and 18 talks about love. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so we are in this world. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. You see, Jesus loves us. He died for us. And his perfect love should cast out the fears of what this world has to offer. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears not has been made perfect in love. If there was ever a message that we need to be spreading to those individuals who are questionable about believing, asking questions, why does God allow this? God loves you. He loves me. He loves those who wonder. He loves those who are, are struggling. And you and I, as the body of Christ, outside the four walls of the church, we have an opportunity to share that love. to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So there we have what David and gives us a pattern how to address fear. We recognize that it's there. We turn to God and we trust him. We recall what takes place in his word, his holy scriptures. That which reveals to us by the power of the Holy Spirit the attributes of God, the promises of God. And he also tells us that we are not to anticipate, to stew upon and worry about evil to come because God is in control. Now, that's not how we fear, how not to fear. Let's look at John the Revelator and what the Lord Jesus Christ says, why we shouldn't fear. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. Has he touched you this morning? And all oh, the joys that filled my soul, something happened. And now I know. He touched me. I hope he's 
touched you this morning. Jesus laid his right hand on John. The right hand is significant of the hand of power. Jesus, who John knew prior to the crucifixion, knowing the trials and tribulations that he was going through in the, on the Isle of Patmos because of being exiled, because he proclaimed the word of God to the Gentile world and to Rome. Jesus says, don't be afraid. Fear not. Why should we not fear? We have no reason to fear because Jesus gives us these four points. Wow. Four points for David, four points for, for Jesus. That's an eight-point uh, message this morning. Jesus tells John, and he tells you and I, Why not to be afraid? Why not to fear? Jesus said, I am the first and the last. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. I am the great I am. As he told Moses before he went out of the desert, tending sheep to go back to the flock there in Egypt, he said, who shall I say sent me? You tell them folks, the great I am. I am sent you. There is no other. Absolutely, positively, I, he is the beginning and the end. You can go to the graves of all the major isms of the world. You can go find, dig up Joseph Smith. You can go dig up Mohammed. You can go dig up Buddha. You can go dig up whatever. You know what you're going to find? You're going to find dead man's bones. But you go to the tomb outside of Jerusalem. And what are you going to find? An empty grave. He's not there. He is risen. And that's number two. He said, I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. Jesus, the man, Jesus, our Savior, died on a cross. They put him in a tomb. They put stones in front of it to keep everybody out. You know, death couldn't keep him in the ground. Stones couldn't keep him in the ground. Corona can't keep him in the ground. We have nothing to fear, but because he lives. And by we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, because he lives, we know that we will live also. Because, we're going to be singing that in a couple of weeks. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Woo. If this doesn't get your heart going, you need a Holy Ghost defibrillator. <laughs> he said, I was dead. And I am he who lives. Number three, behold. I am alive forevermore. I am alive forevermore throughout time and eternity. In eternity past, Jesus was alive. In eternity present and future, for all eternity, I will be alive forevermore. Even though he was resurrected from the dead, he will live forever. Even Lazarus, who was dead four days, Lazarus the man, Somewhere along the line, he died again. But not my Savior, not my Jesus. He is alive forevermore. And then it says this, amen. In other words, do you agree, church? Do you agree those sitting out there in front of those computer screens? We talk about social, uh, I'm not going to go there, I'm on this scroll here. I am he. I am alive forevermore. Amen. That's number three. Number four. The fourth point. Jesus said, I have the keys to hell and death. 
I have the keys to the grave. Jesus determines. And Jesus alone has the power and the authority over death, hell, and the grave. And he can do that because he resurrected. He was dead. He's resurrected. He lives. What a comfort it is to know that we don't have to face the terrible fear of the sting of death, total separation from Jesus Christ for all in eternity if we have accepted him as our Lord and Savior. Because he lives, we shall live also. We know how not to fear. And now we know why we shouldn't fear. Wouldn't it be nice if the entire world heard these words of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Wow. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Lord, there may be some who are listening this morning who are unsure as to their destination in eternity. In life, we make these many choices, but eternity has two. If there is someone out there today that has not confirmed your reservation, in the eternal city where Jesus is king. I implore you to do so today. Things are happening in the world. Things are happening moment by moment, being upset and overturned. But we need not to live in fear. But again, God's word gives us hope. Jesus said to his disciples, and he says to us today, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Praise God, he has overcome the world. All of its problems, all of its disease, all of its darkness, He's overcome it. And we can have that same peace in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Because he gave it to us all at Calvary. All the burdens of life, all the fears of life are lifted at Calvary. Our closing hymn this morning is burdens are lifted at
at Calvary. Jesus is very near. One of the thoughts that I wrote down earlier this week. If we knew when the second coming of Christ was or the time of the rapture, would we be as concerned about his glorious return as we are with this pandemic? Something to ponder on until next week. Lord, we would just ask that you would be with us now as we go through yet another time of another storm, another upheaval in our life. May we cling to you. May we grab hold of the nail-scarred hands and know that you're there for us, holding us up, walking with us, being there for us. Be with each and every one that is listening this morning. Bless and keep them, keep them safe till we all meet together again or we meet you in the air. In Jesus' name, Master and Savior, I pray.